morning and welcome to q and I'm Tony Jones, here to answer your questions tonight. The Minister for Social Services, Christian Porter. Actor, dancer and disability advocate, Kirina Stammel. Liberal Democratic Senator David Lionhelm, the Shadow Minister for Infrastructure, Transport and Tourism, Anthony Albanese, and La Trobe University's Emeritus Professor of Politics, Judith Brett. Please welcome our panel. <laughs> Q&A is live on ABC TV and radio at 9.35 Eastern Standard Time. You can also stream us live on iView, YouTube, Facebook and Twitter, Periscope. Well, our first question comes from Talis Hayden. The recent terror activity in Manchester and London has dramatically increased the threat to nations around the globe, including Australia. Some are now suggesting harsh new preemptive detention laws for use against suspected terrorists, even without definitive evidence of jihadist activity. Does the panel support these laws that could possibly save thousands of lives, but might jeopardise the freedom of potentially innocent suspects? Christian Porter, start with you. Well, uh, tell us, it's a very good question and there's a lot of theory in there. I guess what we need to understand is that in the Australian environment, we have effectively thwarted 12 terrorist attacks uh, since 2014 when the threat level was raised. We've arrested 63 individuals. Uh, it is a very difficult environment and the observation I'd offer you is that the environment in terms of the threat is evolving all the time. And of course, every responsible government has to also evolve in terms of trying to keep up with that threat. So we uh, constantly look at a range of issues, legislative, in terms of administrative and procedural issues around how you respond on the ground. Uh, that particular issue was one that is now getting some public thought and attention. And of course, that's something that we will give some due consideration to. But you also have to respond cautiously, particularly when you are talking about fundamental freedoms. Uh, Christian, uh, you've obviously had advice from some of your Cabinet colleagues on this hostage incident in Melbourne tonight, in which two people were killed. Do you believe, does the government believe, this was a terrorist incident? Uh, look, I, I mean, not much is served by having members of the government sort of give running commentary on things that are um, so fresh. Uh, I have received some um, briefings from one of the National Security Advisers in the Prime Minister's office. Certainly the information I've got is that uh, a terrorist relation to what occurred in Melbourne is certainly not being ruled out at the moment, but I couldn't say much more. Uh, one thing we know is that evidently, it's been reported now at least, that Channel 7 received a call from the suspect, allegedly, uh, who said, this is for IS, this is for Al-Qaeda. Um, is that the extent of your intelligence or, uh, or is something known about this person? Look, I, it just it, nothing is served by me going into information that I've received, but certainly um, Vic Pohl, the Victorian police, are not ruling out this incident being terrorist related. Uh, OK, and just a very quick one on the question that we were uh, we had up there. It's just before we go on to the other panellists. Do you think there is a big constituency in this country, a powerful consi constituency in your own party for tougher new terror laws? Well, I, I think you have to constantly reassess what you're doing, not only on the legislative front, but in terms of how you have interface, obviously, between armed forces and tactical response groups on the ground. I mean, one of the good things about the way in which we respond in Australia, and I might just also add that um, Anthony's here, this has been an issue of some bipartisanship, the way in which we've amended legislation to deal with foreign fighters, the way in which we've looked internally at our own procedures and responses. And if you look at the inquiry into the Lint Cafe siege, we are a country who is absolutely transparent and we scrutinise ourselves in our responses. So I think that that is something that we have to constantly do as the threat evolves. But again, legislative responses have to be looked at carefully, uh, cautiously, but of course you need to be robust and you need to maintain to a large extent, the bipartisanship that we have maintained across the two major okay, parties. Let's, uh, let's uh, hear about that. Anthony Albanese, um, would Labor back tough new terrorism laws of the type that Theresa May is now demanding in the UK? Well, what we won't do is make policy on the run. One of the reasons why we've been successful, as uh, Christian said, uh, is because we've acted on the basis of proper advice from the appropriate authorities, from the security agencies. We've been through a process whereby legislation has been examined with a great deal of rigour. The government's been prepared to change its legislation 
uh, on the basis of making sure that we achieve, of course, two objectives. The first objective and the primary objective of government, not a particular government, but government as a whole, is to keep Australians safe. But the second objective as well is to remember that uh, you don't uh, win uh, the struggle against totalitarian fascism of whatever variety, be it Islamic terrorism or any other, by completely giving up your freedoms. So you need to get the balance right. So, I you, but can I just interrupt you for a moment? Are you suggesting that you would be wary about new control no, orders? I, I, I'm, new control I'm orders suggesting, that, Tony, with, well, with, with let respect... Me just, no, let me just finish respect, the point, though. Because, no, with respect, Tony... Yes, go ahead. What, what I'm going to not do is get a question on Q&A uh, without notice. That's exactly the point. That, that leads to bad decision-making. What we need to do is to examine precisely what's required, act in a sober fashion, uh, particularly as well. We need to be cautious in the wake of a, a, a catastrophic event like occurred in London or in Manchester of immediately saying, we need to do this right now. We need to make sure that we act appropriately and correctly. We're doing that. We're doing it as well in a bipartisan way. And, and quite frankly, we've been pretty successful. OK. Uh, David Lionhelm, what Theresa May is actually talking about uh, is introducing new control <coughs> orders targeting people who have not yet committed crimes but who are suspected of terrorist activity. Mm. Um, do you, can you imagine something like that? happening here? We have them here. We have control orders and uh, yep. uh, I was rather unhappy about them. I prefer that to preventive detention orders. It's sort of like being on bail um, or parole but you haven't committed an offence yet. I, I'm very unhappy about, um, about both of them but preventive detention orders I think is an order of magnitude worse. Um, the, the, uh, the thing is of course these terrorists and they're, they're uh, uh, Salafists and Wahhabists from the Sunni side of, of um, Islam. So we have to be, you know, specific about who we're talking about. Um, they want to destroy our freedoms. They don't believe in free speech, freedom of association, freedom of worship, um, all of the things that we regard as fundamental freedoms. If we give them up, they've won. And if we do it to ourselves, that's doubly bad. So I think we have to be very, very careful that we don't, we don't allow them to win by default. So preventive detention orders um, I really hate and control orders I'm very uncomfortable about, although I had a chat to the security agencies in the Senate or in Canberra recently and uh, um, yeah, yeah, there's worse things than that. You have to wear a bracelet, an ankle bracelet or something like that, I think. But they're also a very effective part of our overall response. And, mm. you know, this government, with the cooperation of the opposition, have strengthened that type of legislative response. Now, it may be that you have to constantly look at these things, and that's, that's likely that you constantly evolve your responses, but you have to do that in a cautious way. And, of course, as you know, David, the way in which control orders and preventative detention orders work is that there are a range of procedural protections built into the legislation. So it's self-legislatively, there's a caution built into it, but they are proving to be effective tools. And I think that, again, I'd come back to the point that we have disrupted and prevented 12 significant terrorist attacks in this country since 2014. That is not something that you see on the front page of the paper every day. But that's done through parliamentary process, appropriate legislative responses, outstanding intelligence and law enforcement agencies. And you have to be ever vigilant, as we've seen through experiences overseas in London and elsewhere. Okay. What, what the, what can, I, can I just interrupt you? I just want to hear from the women on the panel mm. first. Uh, Kieran, you've uh, lived in... Well, actually, you live in the UK now. Yep. You've lived in Manchester. Mm -hmm. You've lived in London. Can you imagine the people in those cities reaching a point where, as Theresa May said, the Prime Minister, enough is enough. Um, extremism now needs to be tackled in a totally different way. Well... I personally have found the Brits to be very resilient people. I mean, they've had terrorism historically for a very, very long time and in different forms. So, you know, um, as a people, they're used to adapting to the threats as historically they've kind of evolved over the years. Um, I find that they stay very open. They're very good at going back to business the next day. That seems to be a very important part of dealing with it. Um, I 
I don't know. I mean, I was quite shocked when I moved to England in terms of how much CCTV there was everywhere in terms of always being watched wherever I went. That was something as an Australian I was a little bit surprised by. I mean, I don't know whether or not we've got that much here, but I felt I could see cameras almost on every corner, which was something that was quite new to me when I first went over. Um, I worry a little bit about going down the road of minority report, this kind of idea of, of you know, uh, pre emptively, um, you know, uh, arresting people if we were to sort of go that far. Um, but I just, I don't that know. That sort of sounds it's... a little bit like what the Prime Minister's talking yeah, about. Yeah, I mean... It's I, hard to judge because you haven't seen I mean, Lord. there's a part of me that's like, go see Minority Report and, you know, talk about the film. Um, it's a very bad film, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I think the issues that it, that it raises, like, you know, in terms of, I guess, as a society, uh, addressing these ideas... But I'm an artist, I love stories, and I think stories are a, gr a great way to explore the ideas, how they affect people. Um, so that's often how I kind of, you know, come at it, is I want to see how, you know, people respond to these things in a creative way as kind of, you know, exploring it in that kind of bubble. Um, so I don't know. I mean, I, I don't think that they would want to go too much further. I mean, I'm going, you know, back there to live. I don't think I want that level of scrutiny. But actually, already, I kind of, even when I'm on Skype, put a little bit of blue tack over the camera because I'm, I'm worried that somebody's watching and that's just, you know, me not breaking the law in my own house I'm a little bit. So it's difficult. I think I would need to see evidence-based policy come into play. OK, uh, Judith, what do you think? Um, and is Australia... I mean, as a historian, you'd know that... Um detention uh, has been part of our culture, uh, particularly in the Second World War, we detained so-called enemy aliens. Yes, and, we'd, and we had legislation that was going to detain communists. And I, the communists, uh, though, uh, had never uh, perpetrated the sorts of, cr of, of murders of, of civilians that we're now dealing with. So I think there's some similarities in terms of uh, the legislation in the Communist Party that was defeated in the Communist Party referendum, which was to um, lock people up on the basis of what they might do. But on the other hand, I think we're dealing with a much more serious situation. I think I've got two things that I'd say, which are not necessarily completely answering the question. One is I think it's an in incredibly difficult uh, task that we're asking our security forces at all levels to do. And I think as civilians, we have to accept that actually they're not going to be 100% successful all the time. You know, it seems to me it's when you've got these, in a way, lone wolves or lone wolf packs, you know, that it's really extremely difficult and we mustn't blame them when uh, attacks happen. I think that's really important. The second thing I'd say is that I don't see these acts as being attacks on our freedoms so much as being acts of revenge um, by young Muslim men who see the West... I mean, I think until the this political situation in the Middle East is sorted out, we're going to have to live with this because they um, see Muslim children being killed. Now, they also... Terrorists are killing Muslim children as well. But I think there's an element of sort of just revenge and mayhem in this, that it's not as ideological as perhaps is sometimes... It has the inevitable effect of impinging our freedoms. Yes, I mean, we're worried as parents whether our kids can go to a concert. I mean, that is the, the terrible result. And I suspect some of that, if not a great deal of it, is actually intended. But intended or not, the effect of it is to abridge our freedoms. Yeah, David, I catch you off before, so uh, a chance to jump back in if you want. Yeah, well... Um... I was going to say the security agencies have told me that the control orders uh, have a, a behaviour modifying effect on some of the people who are subject to them. And I also w was going to add in that I think we have to get over this idea of thinking about people in groups. It's, uh, it's individuals who commit crimes and the focus of the uh, police and others who, who are responsible for uh, keeping this, this sort of thing under control has to be on the individuals with, with the ideas and the theories and the inclinations and, and uh, tendencies towards uh, violence. Now, uh, that's... You know, they, uh, they did a survey in uh, the UK recently and surveyed all the... I think all the Muslims, I'm not sure whether it's split into Sunnis and Shias, but they found out 4% of them harboured violent, uh, uh, violent thoughts and were sympathetic to the kinds of things that ISIS does. 
Now, once they, if they can identify those people, then so at least they can watch them a little more carefully than they can watch my mother or, or my, my sisters or, or you or me, that sort of thing. So I think it's focusing on the people that really matter. That, Again, the I, same thing goes in general security overall. I don't think that's right either. I mean, individuals perpetrate perpetrate crimes, but what we've seen um, in Paris with public open space offences, uh, recently in London, is highly organised networks of individuals, both in terms of the way in which individuals are radicalised, but also the way in which offences are perpetrated. I mean, these terrible criminal deeds are perpetrated by highly organised, sophisticated groups. They uh, manage to get weapons, whether they're edged weapons or trucks or semi-automatic weapons, as was the case in France. I mean, our intelligence agencies are dealing with a very high level of sophistication and organisation, both in the radicalisation element of these offences, but also in the way that they play out on the ground. And yeah, would, would this government difficult. be prepared to, as Theresa May is calling for, rein in the internet, regulate it globally, work with big internet companies, put pressure on them to close down all the extremists? Well, well, I think that the British Prime Minister has made a very valid point, and I think that our Prime Minister today has endorsed the fundamental notion that there is too much carriage, voluntarily, by services like Google and others, of hatred on the internet. Now, whether that be uh, Islamist extremism or anti-Semitism, if you operate the carriage service, surely you must bear some responsibility, at least at an ethical level, to ensure that you are not carrying that sort of hatred over your communications network. Now, that is a matter that we can work as governments with large enterprises who run these carriage networks, but I think that that is a valid consideration and point that we need to develop further. But if you do that, won't it just shift to another methodology? Do you know what I mean? Like, it's not just the internet. You've got gaming where people can communicate with one another while they're playing live games. You've got lots of different ways of actually communicating across you know, globally these networks. There's a level on which I actually feel like you can't police everything. It's, it's actually impossible. I mean, you know, there's so much data out there that, it, that it's actually potentially really overwhelming that there's something where I would like to see if a focus slightly shift maybe on trying to prevent the circumstances, you know, which kind of breed uh, people that are resulting in, in, and angry and unable to... That's exactly what Theresa May said is happening, of course. These right. sites are breeding extremism. Are they? I mean, I'm sure that they are to a degree, but I also think that there's a level on which that, you know, they're the... They're the meeting places that these... Like, I don't know, it's, for me, I'm, I'm wondering if it's a little bit sort of chicken and egg where, you know, yes, they're using these sites, but is it also not a way that you can actually then, you know, use those sites to kind of... I don't know. I, I don't have the answers. It's, 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 it's nonsense. It's like blaming the telephone for, for a bunch of uh, bank robbers conspiring to, uh, to rob a bank, you know. It's ridiculous. And I also disagree... With, uh, uh, with the suggestion that these people are sophisticated. They're not. They're actually dickheads, most of them. <laughs> and, uh, uh, as, as that, that rather downplays the danger they pose. Yeah, they're dangerous. In multiple they're very people. dangerous dickheads, but let me, let me explain <laughs> why I say they're dickheads. Most of them get caught before they do anything damaging. Hmm. Compare that to drug smugglers, most of whom don't get caught. Let me... Uh, Anthony Albanese. Well, uh, I do think it's wrong to downplay uh, what we're dealing with here. This is an ideological movement uh, driven mm -hmm. by the Salafists and, and funded by some states, Correct. including some that we have uh, positive relationships with. We need to call that out for what it is. It, it is dangerous. It is on... Uh, it, it is propagating hatred of us and our society. And as a result of that, you have people who maybe, you know, they, there was something wrong with them to begin with, but certainly there are people who are motivated to engage in this activity uh, which, which undermines us. Uh, that's the negative side. But on the positive side, 
Um, I think the response of civil society has been quite inspiring in recent times. Right. Whether it be the concert that was held in Manchester today of 50,000 people just saying, no, we're going to go out and we're going to continue to enjoy ourselves, we're going to enjoy music, we're going to celebrate freedom. Whether it be in the UK, thank goodness the election is happening this Thursday. It hasn't been put off. We're going to celebrate democracy. We're going to encourage people to go out there and vote to determine Britain's future, whoever they vote for. It's important that they vote. And uh, I think out of that, has been, I think, uh, a lot of inspirational stories about people providing assistance. The fact that people gathered in Manchester immediately after the, uh, the, the tragedy that happened in their main square. So I think uh, the Western society and, and democracy is resilient and uh, we need to make sure that we cherish that. OK, we'll leave this one on a positive note. It's time to move along. The next question comes from Lily Greer. <clears throat> Senator Lionhelm, Trump backed out of the Paris Agreement this week, saying it would save jobs and industry in the US. You have recommended that Australia abandons it also. <coughs> when so many jobs in Australia depend on environmental tourism, notably the 70,000 jobs in Queensland that depend on a healthy Great Barrier Reef, why should we back out of an agreement that seeks to reduce our carbon footprint? David. Why should we back out of an agreement which uh, sends many of our manufacturing jobs offshore, which seeks to close down our coal mines, which seeks to drive up the cost of electricity so that people have to make a choice between um, uh, keeping their houses warm or uh, going to bed or buying food? Um, you know, think about people on low incomes and the electricity prices. That's a significant uh, consequence of, of staying in the Paris Accord. I would, if I was Donald Trump, I mean, even if you... Even if you are a, a firm believer in climate change, I'm, I'm uh, ambivalent about all that. The Paris Accords did nothing for, um, uh, for climate change. What they did do, though, so even if every country that had made commitments under the Paris Accords stuck by those commitments, and that's a very big if because there was nothing binding about it, they would reduce uh, global temperatures by 0.15 of, uh, of a degree by 2050. Um, however, there was, uh, there was a mitigation fund, a, a climate mitigation fund of $100 billion, billion a year in that fund. And the countries that were going to contribute that $100 billion a year were the United States, Canada, Australia, EU. OK? And that was going to go to all the other countries, that uh, all the developing countries that uh, weren't going to do anything about, uh, about reducing their emissions. I would have pulled America out if I'd been Donald Trump, and I think the best thing for Australia is, uh, is to pull out too. Now, I'm not suggesting we wait, uh, we do it right now, but there will be a, a, a steady parade of countries leaving uh, the agreement once they realise there's okay. no more money to come. Thank you, David. Um, Christian, uh, you've, you've made a commitment, the government appears to stay in um, the Paris Agreement. Is that going to be set in cement, set in stone. That's where we're in and we're staying in. Lily, the wonderful thing about having David Lionhelm on the show is it raises the level of Liberal Labor bipartisanship <laughs> about 100%. So, look, both, both major sides of politics are committed Wait to for the... it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know it's coming, mate. <laughs> I know I can't get away with it too long. But, look, we've, we've met our first um, Kyoto target by 128 million million tonnes of CO2. We're going to meet the 2020 target by another 224 million tonnes. When we get into international agreements like this, we stick to them. We don't just meet, we exceed our targets. Uh, there's no suggestion whatsoever that we'll be withdrawing based on the decision of the Trump administration. Now, the decision so, is So, are you saying it while Malcolm Turnbull is Prime Minister? Well, look, the position, the position of the government is that we are in Paris and staying in Paris. And the reality is that even with... Um, the Trump administration's departure. Um, the ratification of the Paris Treaty covers 70% of all emitters. Um, it is still absolutely a worthwhile global process which we are pursu pursuing with vigour and we're doing very well. Uh, let's test the um, bipartisanship <laughs> here. Uh, Anthony Albanese. Well, it's stay with me, mate. It's a good thing. <laughs> that the go I just want you to stay with Paris. Yep. Uh, and uh, I've seen this movie before, which was that uh, the government, uh, the previous Conservative government, of course, signed up to Kyoto, but after George Bush left, 
uh, the Howard government refused to ratify for a long period of time the Kyoto Protocol. Eventually, uh, on day one of the Rudd government, we ratified the Kyoto Protocol, which is what got us into back into the global game. Look, we have a responsibility to this and to future generations. The idea that David puts forward that uh, somehow econ our economy is damaged by this is completely wrong. Uh, the whole concept in economics of first mover advantage means that we're actually uh, penalised by not being a part of the global system. Uh, this is a, a pretty modest commitment, frankly, that Australia's made. But, uh, you know, if we're talking about long-term sustainable jobs, in the time that I've been coming on this show, uh, renewable energy has gone from something that needs subsidies to a form of energy that is actually moving ahead of fossil fuels in terms of efficiencies, in terms of affordability and, importantly, uh, in terms of uh, job creation as well. So I think that uh, Australia certainly uh, should stay. Uh, we should do other measures as well. We need to have an emissions intensity scheme. The government knows that's the case. Every expert, every economist says that that's the case. Uh, we need that signal uh, to the market, a market-based mechanism, uh, in order to drive that change. So um, a market-based mechanism, essentially a carbon tax, no. bring back a carbon tax? No, 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 Tony, and you're better than that. Um, <laughs> frankly. Uh, well, we're going to find out later in the... That's the, the other Tony says that. <laughs> wait, that wait, any market-based <laughs> mechanism is, is, is that. Uh, an emissions intensity scheme is yeah. a closed system okay. within the energy sector whereby you have essentially uh, an encouragement of cleaner energy above, uh, above less clean energy. It's as simple as that. And it works to drive that change through the system. Uh, we'll wait and see what Finkel has to say. I think Indeed, he he's going to be on the program next week, so we won't go too far into that. Let's, hear, let's, hear, for, let's yes. hear from uh, Judith Brett. Yes. Um, I, Judith, I'd... give us the politics of this, uh, if you wouldn't mind. Oh, no, I want to actually give some advice to the Labor Party. OK. <laughs> That's all right. Thank so God. do I. Here we are. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> uh, which is that if the um, low-intensity target is what the government adopts because it's something which is acceptable to its um, climate. It might be the same thing, but they don't know. The right wing exactly. of the Liberal, yeah, the Liberal Party, Party don't notice it's the same. Uh, but if that's acceptable, I would it's have going so well. <laughs> that um, the Labor Party would support it. It might not be what they would want if they were in government, but it would be a hell of a lot better than to, to block that so that we're back to where we were when this all started, what, a decade or so ago? You know, that if, that if we don't get... If Labor doesn't get exactly what it wants and this is, the Greens don't get exactly what they want, uh, we've got to get something and then we can so, move so this, And this is where the distinction between the two major parties exists, right? So our Paris commitment is 26 to 28 per cent decrease on 2005 levels by 2030. The Labor Party's policy or, or ambition would be a 45%. Um, now, we say that that is both ambitious, 26 to 28%, but it's ambitious in a way that can preserve our economic development and preserve job growth. Now, that is, a, that is a fundamental distinction between the parties. I actually have to jump in here because the reality is that the planet is getting hotter. Whether or not you believe in climate change, put a pin in that for a second. I want to quote my father which will absolutely delight him. Um, my dad said once, Kirina, you know what? You can't take a dump in the living room and not expect it to affect the ambience of the house. <laughs> right? And this house is our planet. We haven't advanced enough to go anywhere else. We actually need to stop exploring and what well, sorry exploiting fossil fuels by 2050 we're not talking about future generations we're talking about me in my 70s and your children and do you know what's more expensive things like supplementing and subsidizing the fossil fuel industry which we do massively directly and indirectly compared to renewables Renewables, you don't have to buy coal. The wind, the sun, water, you know, tides, things like that are actually free. So that long game 
is cost effective. It's an industry that will generate jobs. It's innovative. It is better for all of us and we need to go down that road. Otherwise, guys, we are going down along with our neighbours who are going to want to be seeking asylum here because their islands don't exist anymore ah. and extreme weather patterns. This is real, OK? Even just on the level of pollution. And I really despair for my friends who have children because this is a really serious thing. And talking about 26% and even 45%, it's actually not enough. We have to wake up as a species because we are just animals. I, I, okay, David. We have 30 seconds, but we're going to move on to other things. I, I sit next to the Greens in the Senate and hear that claptrap all the time. Oh, it God. is absolute garbage. And there's, I must tell there's you really, old men. there really is. <laughs> really? Oh. There are no old women who are Excuse climate. Excuse me, how old are you? Well, I'm an old woman who believes in climate change. It's the old men who continually, who are all going to be dead by the time it actually you know what? hits. Do you know what? China is not going to do a thing about their emissions until 2030. Not a thing. That's the Paris Accord. So we should export all our jobs to China while they just wait until 2030 before saying, oh, yes, we think our emissions might have peaked now. Now we'll start doing something about them. I mean, what kind of China is we? is actually investing massively yeah. in renewable energy. They are. Under Paris, not a thing. And they and, 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 thing. and as well as having market-based mechanisms, China can do it. Economically, and their emissions are going to go up until 2030, and ours are supposed to go futures. down. Hang on, what we're nonsense. all talking over each other what at nonsense. the moment. Sorry. I tell you what, we're going to do. We're going to just leave that one there because we've been here before. <laughs> we know how it ends. It doesn't end. Um, the next question is from Charles Redhead. A very different subject. Uh, good evening. I am 14 years old, in Year 9, and live in Sydney. The median house price in my area is $1.75 million. In my commerce class, we calculated how long it would take to save for a deposit and pay for a mortgage. It would take me roughly 18 years to save for a deposit, and if interest rates stay at the current rates, the principal and interest over the entire life of the loan would be $3.25 million. At current income tax rates, uh, it would take me approximately 165 years to pay for this mortgage. <laughs> In reference to Menzies, I feel that our generation are the forgotten people. How do you envisage my generation to ever own a home based on these statistics? Judas Brett, you've written about this, so I'll start yes. with you. <laughs> OK, thanks. That's a terrific question. And I think... You, you referred to Menzies. I mean, Menzies made home ownership absolutely central to the stability and citizenship of the 1950s and, you know, the childhood that I enjoyed and that many of your parents would have enjoyed. And something has gone badly wrong, I think, over the last... Probably the last decade, it seems to have got really worse, where, where if we think of a house, it's both an investment and it's a place, <coughs> a place of shelter. And it's as if the home meaning of that has become sheared off and we, we think of a house in terms of property and investment and those who've got get more and those who haven't stay out. Now, Judith, I think... Kate, you, you've actually called this the new class divide, well, home I... ownership. Yes, well, I think one of the things it's doing is it's, um, it's entrenching inequality because people who've got parents who've already got enough wealth to be able to help them buy a house... Uh, will be able to get houses. So access to capital is becoming a major determinant of people's life chances in the way it was in Jane Austen's day. You know, who you married and, and hanging around the dying uncle to see if you were the one who got <laughs> the, the bequest, you know? Um, now, I've been thinking a lot about this, about how to solve it, because, you know, the last budget just tinkered. And to even talk about how we need policies for affordable housing, which in fact means public housing and welfare housing, acknowledges that actually for bulk of, of, of first-home buyers, the housing is not affordable. There's been massive rises in asset prices over the last decade for people who've got houses. I think that we have to start thinking about estate taxes, basically. I know this is a big jump, but that, that the government is not getting any way of being able to get um, 
some benefit out of that massive rise of asset taxes, which is actually going to fuel inequality and mean that there will be a lot of people who are going to head into old age. There already are without housing. So there's going to be a bigger demand made on the public purse. And so there's going to be need more money. And it seems to me that an estate, estate tax, 10 or 15 per cent at the federal level so that the states can't compete for old people, <laughs> like they did when Bjorki <laughs> Peterson uh, introduced it, is something well, I would see, like to see. Let's see if Labor might jump on board that one. You've got a few <laughs> ideas for tax rises in the, uh, in the housing area. What about that one? Well, what we've said we'll do is uh, negative gearing to change it, modest changes to negative gearing capital gains tax. We don't say that, that that's going to solve all of the problems, but what it will do is make sure that the first-time home buyer uh, bidding for a property isn't competing with someone who effectively is subsidised by the taxpayer. That's why it's so unfair. The existing system subsidises investors over homeowners, over residents. Uh, and that is meaning, I think, a, a big problem in our cities. Successful cities are inclusive cities. You shouldn't be able to determine someone's income by just looking at their postcode. Because what you speak about isn't just having an impact on house prices, it's rents as well. And, you know, in where I represent, used to be a very working class blue collar area, the inner west of Sydney. Now I have uh, people who work for me can't afford to live uh, in the seat, either rent or buy. So, Anthony, would you, would Labor's policies bring prices down? Was that part of the aim of your policy? Well, what it's aimed at is, is certainly decreasing over a period of time the, the price of houses. Yes, it would. Uh, but pretty it pretty controversial. To, a lot of people well, out it, there own it, it houses and want the prices to, to keep going up. Well, their prices aren't go, will go up by less, effectively, is, is what would happen. Mm. Uh, so you're not going to get a, a fall but what you are going to get as well by allowing for capital gains tax and negative gearing for new constructed houses is to also do something to boost supply. There's a whole range of measures needed. It seems to me as well um, that social housing, why is it that every Tom, Dick and Harry can make money out there speculating on housing, but state and territory governments have failed dismally in terms of social housing? Yeah. And, and I think there's a, a way in which they can do that as well. We did some things when we were in federal government that were quite effective as part of the global financial crisis. But we do need to have, I think, a, a considered debate because it's becoming more and more urgent. And it is, it's not so much a, the new class divide, it literally is the generation divide. Let's, uh, let's hear from the government and then we'll go back to our questioner um, and hear what he thinks about the government's response. So, Charles, I've heard a whole range of stats in this area. It's the first time I've heard those ones, so you've now exposed yourself to fact-check and <laughs> inside both sides of politics, but I'll be very interesting to drill down and have a look at them. I mean, look, largely and essentially, this is a problem about supply, particularly in a place like Sydney. Um, housing prices haven't got the same edge to them in other parts of the country, so we need to be very careful, first of all, to see this as a problem that has geographical limits and where it is different from place to place in Australia. Um, I think that in addressing supply, there are a range of issues in the recent budget. I think it's a little bit um, unfair to call them merely tinkering. Christian, can I just ask uh, the obvious question, really? Why do you think it's only about supply? I, well, I when think you've got these investment incentives that we were just hearing about in place for a long time, that do benefit investors over first home buyers? Well, I don't, I don't think it's only about supply, but I think it is essentially about supply. And when you look at the data on this, the calculation is that there's a shortage of about 270,000 units of housing, affordable housing units in Australia. It is essentially a supply problem. The difficulty I have with Anthony's proposition and the Labor position on negative gearing is that there is one absolute rolled gold certainty about what they want to do to negative gearing in terms of its effect on the housing market, and that is people who would otherwise have been investing and who don't get the um, standard tax incentive will increase their rents. And does that make it harder or easier for your generation well, let's go, let's rent go, before well, let's they go purchase back. to Kristen, save their you can, deposit? You can jump back in, but let's go back and hear from Charles. Now, you've heard a range of propositions here. What are your, what are your thoughts? Uh, the way I feel, I've always, I just, the, with 
I've always got um, concerns with the, with the thing that I don't think is addressed is foreign investment and foreign ownership. And I feel that Australia's interest with housing is it has it's not addressed. And I feel that it's sort of been hidden. It's sort of you know I I, I think one of the most important things is that we address. Um, the fo foreign ownership and how much we tax for foreign investment so we have our own people in homes. And also one thing as well, I can't stand it when when you've got people saying that, you know, you're forcing you, because I live on the northern beach, it's forcing you to move to other areas, you know, I'll oh, just move, it's cheaper there. We're trying to create connected communities here and it would create, it's impractical, it would create even more disruption if we're, try, if we're saying to people, move out here, move there, it's cheaper. OK, let me bring in uh, Kieran. Could you afford to live where your parents lived? No, <clears throat> um, I couldn't. Actually, out of all of my groups of friends, only one of them is still living in the area that we actually grew up. Everybody has moved further and further afield. Um, actually, my sister's gone all the way up to Tamworth, um, another has changed state. Uh, as a disabled woman, um, being able to afford a property that's appropriate for my needs in my area is forget it. Um, it it's, you know, <laughs> completely out of my reach, to use a pun. Um, <laughs> but I, I really do think that we perhaps actually need to question home ownership as an investment at all because it's a resource and it's a finite resource to a degree. Um, so I worry in that I've seen London, for example, um, multi-million pound properties empty because they've been bought as investment properties, nobody's living in them. Uh, so, you know, for me, that's a wasted resource. So it's about, I think, actually having to redistribute that. And, you know, if, if that means that it's not such a great investment anymore, but people have houses and families and families are invested in their local areas. Well, I think that the payoff for that, for me personally, is a really positive one. Um, David, what do, you, what do you think? I mean, um, there's a range of uh, possibilities here. Labor wants to, to rein in negative gearing and the incentives from capital gains. We've heard another proposition from Judith um, about taxing people at death, I think it was. No, don't call it a death tax, call it an estate tax. Estate tax. <laughs> Even though it's a death tax? No, well, it's not really, because the person's dead. It's an tax on the estate that is going to you, their Well, heads. you know what? That, they tried, that was gotten rid of in Every, the 1970s and yes. it had terrible results where widows of a deceased husband were forced out of family homes because they look, couldn't afford could the death duties. It can be designed we've been down that road. Other and okay, I, was, I was trying to bring David in here <laughs> to get his opinion. So, but uh, I, I think we've figured out where you're at there. Go ahead. Yeah. Well, the housing housing prices, prices of anything really, are a function of a market. There's demand and there's supply. Uh, mucking around on the demand side, so uh, rules on foreigners and rules on first home buyers and rules on negative gearing and all that sort of stuff affect the demand side. So you can play around with that. But Christian is, is fundamentally right. There is, in Sydney in particular, and to a lesser extent Melbourne, there is a shortage of supply. And why is there a shortage of supply? Two reasons. One is the planning rules are very restrictive. It's really quite hard if you want to build a house or units or townhouses or whatever to get approval. Councils are very anal about approving them. And uh, it can take a long time, take a lot of argument and, uh, and raises the cost significantly. Uh, and the other thing that's, uh, that's affecting it uh, on the supply side very substantially is that the state governments have uh, control over land release for new suburbs and new areas and things like that. Um, Landcom in New South Wales, for example, used to be uh, just told release land. Now they're told release land at a profit. So they only release it when they're going to make a handy, a handy bit of money for the state government out of it. So as a result, they don't release as much. So as a result, supply is constrained and prices go up. It's, it happens the, the, in all the, the states. Question, the questioner made uh, a very strong uh, point there about uh, foreign investment yes. being a but core problem. Just briefly on that. Yeah, there, are a lot of, there are a lot of changes in the last budget that dealt with that vacancy yeah. issue um, and far more stringent. I don't think there's any disagreement from Labor about those changes. So, yeah, it's an issue, but it's being addressed, but it's one of many issues. Yeah, I, I, I don't think it and will make any difference. And it's not huge when you look at the numbers. No. The truth is it's that worth it's doing. not huge. Yeah, sure. I, I, I disagree. It's not worth doing. It just creates more bureaucracy, more public yeah. servants, more cost, um, and there's not enough foreign buyers to, to make a big difference to the demand. If, if we opened up the, the rules on supply, 
Um, well, I don't think prices would fall in Sydney and Melbourne, but they would stay flat for probably a decade or two and allow incomes to catch up. All right. Now, remember, if you hear any doubtful claims on Q&A tonight, send a tweet using the, fas uh, the hashtags FactCheck and Quanda. Keep an eye on our Twitter account, RMIT ABC FactCheck, and the Conversation website for the results. The next question comes from Nicole Look. And my question's to Christian Porter. Having applied to the NDIS for my two daughters who have a disability, I have found that access to the scheme is difficult. Inadequate initial plans mean that successful plans depend on multiple reviews and are highly dependent on a person's ability to advocate for themselves or their dependents. How will this system resist perpetuating inequalities when those we least well off are less able to advocate for themselves? Okay. So, Nicole, I take it by virtue of the fact that you've um, had plans um, initiated and reviewed that there has been access granted to the NDIS? Yes, for the... there has. Yeah. So, uh, what I would say to you is that there's clearly improvements that we're going to need to engage in on an ongoing basis to ensure that the experience for participants in the NDIS around planning uh, is as good as it can possibly be. And when we're moving from a system in trials that had 30,000 participants in three years up to an estimated 460,000, the scale of that enterprise is absolutely immense. I mean, it, it is a once-in-a-generation reform. So, for me as a minister, uh, with the help of the NDIA board and the NDIA organisation, our task is to ensure that the planning and participant experience is of a consistently high level. And I don't think that consistency is there at the moment. Uh, but I would note... Does that, does that mean that you essentially agree that better advocates get better results? Or well, people who, are, who have carers who are better able to advocate for them or who themselves are better advocates get a better result? Well, look, I, I, I can't say that I've got any sort of statistical information that would show that to be the case or not to be the case. But, but our task in any event is to ensure that planning and reviews of planning is consistently high across Australia. Like the point of the NDIS is the experience in North Queensland should be of a similarly high standard to the experience in Sydney. What, what I would note, though, is that planning and then reviews of plans is an integral part of the NDIS because the whole point of giving sufficient resources to a person with a disability is to improve the situation so that needs will change over time. Now, there might be very significant improvements and what we found with respect to the first review of the first plan is that I think the statistic was that in more than half the occasions the amount of the package actually increases, but in other instances over time the amount of the package will decrease. So it, it is a massive social enterprise, a logistic and organisational feat. Uh, we are working very hard at it. I don't pretend that every experience is perfect. Christian, can I just, can I just quickly uh, go back to Nicole, our questioner? Are, are you actually saying that you've personally had problems or that you're seeing potential for problems for people who are less well able to advocate for um, themselves? Both. I feel as though uh, it is a, a, it's a very hard fight to get what is needed. I believe in the system uh, and I believe in the premise of it and I'm grateful for what support we have, but I feel as though we have to fight very hard to make sure that those needs are met. And I see people uh, who I know of who don't have strong ad mm. uh, advocates and their needs are less met than what my children's needs are. So, so can I, can I, Christian, can I just hear from uh, Kieran here because she has experience of a similar system I've in the UK? A, I do. I've, I've seen the system in England which has been in place for longer. It's a little bit different um, and it's sort of broken up into different sections. I have to say over there as well, if you are a strong advocate, you also get the resources, uh, which I think is um, a very unfortunate way for, for systems to work because disabled people are dealing with a lot on a day-to-day -day basis and the admin of that can be very daunting and also very emotional. Um, I know personally when I have to talk about what I can't do, which is what you have to talk about when you're applying for resources, when you spend your day trying to do the things you need to do. It is so hard and so emotionally challenging to honestly say, do you know I find this a bit difficult? Because you have to I, essentially, you know, uh, throw yourself a pity party, which is true and honest, 
but you can't dwell in it because if you dwell in it, you wouldn't get out of bed in the morning and live a life. So it's a really difficult balance to strike. Um, so I'd say across the board with every bureaucratic system, that's been the case. I'd be interested to know how actually you know, you guys are planning to get feedback from the people that are using these services yep. so that this can be addressed. Because one thing actually that Australia has got in its favour rather than uh, uh, the UK system, which is just that it's older, so it, it's it's had a little bit more tinkering and it's it's got, unfortunately, um, it's been damaged recently uh, by politics and, and political agendas. And um, what Australia's got that's actually a bit of an advantage is because this is kind of a new system, um, it can be built better and actually built in a way that the bureaucracy could be more okay. efficient. Let's hear, if, uh, and, and let's hear if the government... Yeah, Karina, you're exactly right. So, for instance, what the new NDIA board has done is after the first year of transition to full scheme, they've gone out and interviewed a whole range of actual participants who've had the on-the-ground on experience that you've had from start to finish through the planning and review stages so that we can learn from the process. Because, of course, it is a very new process now being rolled out at scale. But there is a central tension here on the part of government to make sure that reasonable necessary supports are what is objectively the reasonable and necessary support. You would have seen that um, front page of the Daily Telegraph here that suggested that the NDIS is funding horse whispering, which is just utter nonsense. But there will always be the tension between generosity and stringency in the planning process. And part of that is maintaining the very high public confidence that we have in the NDIS. But yes, we are constantly reviewing, constantly looking at what we're doing, and this will just get better and better as time Kieran, goes on. Kieran, just give us, just a, a, for the audience here and for the broader audience, just a quick sort of assessment as to why it's a good social okay. investment. Um, OK, so quick crash course in uh, disability studies. Um, I identify as a disabled woman. I know some people will go, oh, but you've just got dwarfism, you're a bit small, you're not disabled. To that, let me just quickly shortcut it. How would I make a cup of tea in your standard kitchen in your house? OK? So, obviously, I have access needs. The NDIS would mean that I can apply for adaptations to my home so that I'm not financially penalised or punished for being disabled. And this is a really important thing. Would also mean that I could apply for the cost of adaptations to a standard vehicle because I can't obviously jump behind a wheel and just drive any car. So. We live in a world where the market actually... The, there is nothing to meet my need. A kitchen that would meet my needs and my average height husband's needs, you're looking at at least $30,000, at least, because you're talking about moving parts. Um, disabled people tend to earn less, um, so, you know, you can see the disadvantage there. So that's literally a crash course, OK? People can apply for different needs in order to get out of the house and also, actually, brilliantly to work and join the workforce. They can apply for the support they need to contribute and participate in society. The other thing I want to say is every dollar that is spent on the NDIS, you ordinary disabled and non-disabled Australians will see come back to your own pocket. Because all the NDIS does, it means a disabled person is able to get out of the house, go to the local shopping centre, buy themselves a coffee because they can finally get out of the house because they've finally been given a shower and clothing and they're going to spend that money in the community. This is not money that you're giving to disabled people that's going to go offshore into an offshore bank account earning interest somewhere. You are going to see every dollar of the NDIS come back to you because it's going to mean that disabled people are working, paying tax on their income, employing carers, carers pay tax on their income. They're going to be out participating in the community, enjoying a life and spending money, you know? So that's the one thing I want you all to hold on to. Every pound that England spends on access to work, which is uh, similar, which is, well, overlaps a bit with the NDIS, for every pound, the economy receives a pound 48 back. So it actually makes economic sense to give the disabled community access to these resources. OK. I, I've got to throw... Uh, we've got other questions to get to. I'll quickly throw to the other side of politics. Look, Anthony, I, you... I, I, I think you just nailed it, Karina, <laughs> <laughs> frankly. OK. <laughs> so, so bipartisanship still exists on the NDIS. There's no, there's no, there's no sort of little... Uh, non-bipartisan elements here. We created it. 
Uh, we created it. We do have this little uh, issue about we paying created the last it. part of it at the moment. No, no. We created it and we fully funded it. <laughs> they support it. That's a good thing. It is a good thing for all the reasons that Karina just uh, outlined for, for everyone. This is something that is uplifting for the nation. OK, let's move on. The next question comes from Joseph Hooper. So the budget revealed plans to introduce a drug testing trial for 5,000 people claiming new start and youth allowance payments, <coughs> with those failing being put onto a cashless welfare card and having their welfare payments quarantined. Is this a strategy to <coughs> vilify the youth and unemployed to draw attention away from the lack of jobs and growth the government has promised? David, I'll uh, start with you on this. So drug testing for mm, welfare good, recipients. Good one to start on, yes. Um, <laughs> So, I'm a libertarian. The, the, uh, the Liberal Democratic Party is based on libertarian principles. Um, our view is mainly uh, don't mess with the way people spend their money. The question is, is welfare... Are you entitled to put conditions on welfare? If you were giving money to somebody to help them out, not expecting them to work for it, just to help them out because they're in, in trouble, and you said, but I don't want you to spend that on... Uh, alcohol or smoking or gambling or something like that, you'd be perfectly within, within your rights and if the person didn't agree to it, you wouldn't give them the money. So I don't have a problem with the government acting as the intermediary between uh, those of us who contribute via our taxes and, and the recipients of that money, saying, putting uh, conditions on the receipt of that money as long as it's not, they're not working for it because it, then it becomes entirely... Uh, without condition. So I don't mind uh, putting conditions on welfare. Now, so the question is then, should you put conditions such as drug testing on the receipt of, of uh, the dole, unemployment benefits? I, I have trouble with that unless the drug is affecting their ability to get a job. Um, I really can't see how marijuana, for example, unless you turn up to an interview stone, I can't see how it would affect your ability to get a, a job. And in any case, we are now on the point of or starting very slowly, far too slowly, using marijuana for medical purposes. So what happens if you're taking it, you know, to control pain or epilepsy or something like that? You're unemployed, you fail a drug test, you lose your benefits. Um, I, the only drugs that I think would fall in legitimately into that category are the ones that would prevent you from getting a job. OK, Anthony Albanese. Well, I'm concerned about the motive, essentially. Do, is it a good thing that... that uh... People are encouraged to get off drugs. Yes, it is. How do you do that? Rehabilitation, programs, intervention. Uh, is there any funding for it arising out of this or is this just another, you know... Well, it's a pilot program, so well, you presume that if the pilot goes well, there'll be funding. Well, uh, the funding should be there from the beginning, I would have thought. Um, this came from, from nowhere. And uh, this government does have a, a bit of a track record of vilification of people who are receiving welfare benefits. And it, I'm just concerned that this is the latest uh, instalment of that. And so we'll look at the detail of exactly what the government has planned. It hasn't put it all out there yet and examine, I guess, how fair income it is and whether it's actually about improving the lives of people who are on welfare and in enabling them to get a job, or whether it's just another instalment to say, oh, well, if, if you know, to press those buttons, if people are on welfare, maybe there's something wrong with them. Maybe it's because okay. they're on drugs. Let, let's, uh, let's hear from uh, the government. Minister, um, is this just pressing buttons? Well, it, it's absolutely about trying to identify underlying problems that create barriers to employment and improve individual lives by transitioning people into employment. And <coughs> very different from what happens in similar things in the United States. On a first positive test, yes, there'd be income quarantining using card technology. On a second positive test, you'd be assessed by a medical professional that we would pay for, the government in DHS, and they would devise a treatment plan, and your obligation would be to follow the treatment plan. The point of that is that we absolutely know that rates of drug use amongst um, unemployed are 2.5 times higher than amongst employed people. The idea that drug use doesn't create a barrier to employment is utter nonsense. For a start, a whole range There's of employers... There's a bit of drug use in the eastern suburbs amongst employed people in this well, city, though. That... <laughs> um, well, that, that, that I actually well be the had case. an idea. Why can't you 
suggest, why don't all the politicians in Parliament do a drug test as long as this policy is there in place for welfare users? Why don't you guys lead by example? I'm, I'm very happy to take a drug <laughs> test, right? But that decision's not up to me. But look, the, the fact is that we know that drug and al alcohol misuse creates significant barriers to employment. And I'll tell you what, being in charge of the system happens at the moment with people who use drug and alcohol and it creates a barrier to employment. We box them up, we pay them a welfare check and we don't do anything for them. Uh, we do not assist anywhere ne near enough and we have an almost don't ask, don't tell policy where we do not identify and assist people. So this is a trial for 5,000 people in three locations around Australia designed to try and identify those people whose drug and alcohol misuse is creating a barrier to employment and actually do something about it for the first time. But let me assure you that what the system does now is it sets and forgets you if you've got a drug and alcohol problem. Last year, the number of people using drug and alcohol as an excuse for not turning up to something like a job interview increased by 130% in a year. Right? That is not in the best interest of people inside the system. So you identify, you assist, and you do this in a way that is not about stigmatising or vilifying anyone. And the fact is that a whole range of employers in Australia require you to be drug free. So if you want a job at at Linfox or any transport or construction or mining company, the fact is that you'll have to take a drug test. OK. And when you take that drug test, what happens then if you prove positive? You lose welfare, your life gets worse... We're not, we're, but we're not, not taking welfare off anyone, okay, right? We're, so, we're, on a first test, on a first test we quarantine... You can't get better or into rehab. Like, all you can do is have an open-door policy where people can walk through that door when they're ready to walk through that door. And I believe, as a society, it's our job to support people until they're ready to do that in the hope that one day they will. But I mean, to me, this is one of the worst ideas I've ever heard. In <laughs> I, I'm sorry, but I really think that it is do, daft. Do, do, you don't accept there's a kind of reason to it, that it's a progressive thing? No, there because I don't stages. believe that... Um, I don't believe that the essentially this kind of punitive justice is how you deal with drug and alcohol issues. I mean, they're symptomatic of so much more and, and such bigger deals. Yeah. Like, I would much rather but it, but see... But it's actually not punitive. We offer you more services if you test positive. No, those services right, okay, should be so I'm, I'm there. And what the, what the research shows is that those if you mandate treatment... Those services should be there so that you can self -prepare. OK, guys, so we've got, we've got to get to a, a one last question. I, I think we've heard the... Uh, the two different perspectives of that. Um, there's time for one last question. It comes from Steve Rafters. Hi there. This is a question to the panel, um, also to Anthony. There's a saying the, um, that don't let the perfect be the enemy to the good. So with your comments regarding the recent budget, were you stepping up to be on the side of the good and, and instead of the perfect? Anthony. Well, that was a, a rather obscure question, but... Um, <laughs> Almost Delphic. We're, 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 we're getting sort of into, into philosophy now. Um, I don't think so. It's, it's based on the fact that you had a fundamentally different response to the budget than your leader. It's as simple as that. No, well, one of the things that uh, characterised my speech, which characterised uh, my political speeches over 20 years, is that I'm, I'm positive in, in outlook. So I think the history of Australia is that Labor uh, puts forward a progressive idea. It's resisted initially. Eventually, because of, of mass support, uh, concepts like Medicare, you know, Medibank established by Whitlam, abolished by Fraser, adopted by Hawke, now uh, undermined, but they say that they support Medicare. What I said in that speech was that along with Medicare, the MBN, compulsory superannuation, a range of things that they now say they support. They are saying they support the NDOs, good thing. They're saying they support needs-based education, good thing. They're saying they support public transport. The difference is what I also said, though, the second sentence, was that they're not putting it into practice. So it's great that Malcolm Turnbull, I've said this a lot of times, it's good we have a Prime Minister now who supports engagement of the Commonwealth in cities, including support for public transport. It's great that he rides in it and takes selfies on public transport. It's a pity he won't fund them. <laughs> that's the problem. Okay. And that's the gap. It's like the MBN, they say so they support the MBN, but it's a copper-based fraud ban system rather than 
a 21st century solution. And on all of these issues, the investment isn't there. Needs-based education is a good thing that they say that's there, but why is it that you're not getting the investment that's required, uh, which yeah. we provided yeah. when we were in government? Uh, Judith, what do you make of the, the contrasting responses yeah, to the budget, well, the, say, the short and Albanese responses? I've just finished um, writing a biography of Alfred Deakin, who was an early Prime Minister, and he always said, you've got to put policy before party. And it seems to me that that's what the electorate, the citizens, are desperately wanting both sides of politics to do at the moment. And that, um, for example, just to take one example, the fact that Labor is not prepared to support the needs-based system uh, that has been introduced. It's, it may be imperfect, maybe they would fund it better, but I think it's just extremely disappointing uh, that they're whipping up a sectarian ghost again. Um, and that's why I was asking before about, about the, um, what's it, the lower emissions target, which is not what Labor would have introduced, but it's, at least it's a step along the way. And so I'm really hoping that over the rest of this period of government will see a much more cooperative So, so are you are you, so are you making the point that, that Anthony Albanese is on yeah. target with the Deakin way of thinking that Shorten isn't... Well, is no, I, I'm, I mean... I, well, I would hope that Shorten would become on target too. And that Shorten would... I mean, I, I actually think he would... His approval rating would go up if he stopped being so whining and negative <laughs> and actually, yeah. um, you know, said, yes... The needs-based system, it's not exactly how we have it, but we've got to start taking steps along the road. So, well, well, do you agree with that shorten assessment? The, the <laughs> point is, when you look at... <laughs> not at all. <laughs> and, and, look, most people who commented... I mean, not the government. Most people who commented on my speech hadn't read it. If they've actually oh. read it, they'll see that this is a distinction without a difference. The fact is that uh, the government has adopted some of the rhetoric of... Uh, Labor in terms of needs-based education funding, but they're not doing it. Needs-based education funding would not provide for okay. not enough money in Northern Territory public yeah, but schools, we'd get a new for example. System. At least it you'd just get... wouldn't. Okay, look, I'm, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to jump away from you too because we're, we're going to hear from the rest <laughs> of the panel because we're nearly out of time. David, listening to this uh, argument, what do you think? No, I think Shorten was telling the uh, 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 Albo was telling the truth. Um, it's uh, it's a story of Labor having won. It was a Labor budget. Uh, higher taxes and uh, no serious attempt to reduce the deficit is, uh, is Labor victory. And, uh, you know, I think it's a shame. We've got no real choice in the country anymore. You're going to have to vote for the Liberal Democrats. <laughs> <laughs> so, Christian, well, it sounds like you've completely crossed I, the floor and uh, sort of tried to push short. I mean, we, we, are, we are grinding our way back to surplus. There are still a range of savings measures, no doubt. Many of them will be challenging. No, but what about this notion that you just delivered a Labor budget? Well, well here's something that I think is utterly emblematic about the budget, <coughs> which we've spoken a lot about the NDIS tonight, right? In 2020, there is a $4 billion funding gap in the NDIS, and that grows out cumulatively to $55 billion. And we as a government said that even the most virtuous, virtuous of programs has to be paid for, and we've suggested a broad-based increase in the Medicare levy of 0.5%. Now, 75% of the Shadow Cabinet were willing to agree to that. Now, they're not agreeing to that, that increase in the Medicare levy because they think that there's no funding gap. There is a funding gap, but the Labor Party could not bring themselves to agree to this simple, fair mechanism to fully fund the thing that we all know should be fully funded and should go ahead. So I think that is absolutely emblematic between a but government... Didn't they say they'd fund it by not giving a corporate more tax money. cut? Sorry? Didn't our... they say they'd fund it by not giving a corporate well, tax cut? Well, what they've said is that they've got a range of revenue-raising measures. Uh, they've got... Um, a view about reversing small okay. business tax cuts, but none of that they've actually said they would put to the NDIS. This is the fairest, clearest way to fully fund the NDIS. Let's just agree. No, what we've said move is... Move on to administer the... What we've okay, said you've you got 30 seconds and then we close the show. The temporary deficit levy combined with the, uh, the increase in the Medicare levy above $87,000 actually raises $4 billion but you've actually, more. You've already spent your policy on the temporary deficit levy twice. Okay. And That's this is how right. we got into this mess in the first time. You can only spend something once in government. That's the golden rule of public finance. Can I, can I just get, I'm going to give the last word to someone who's clearly cut through tonight, uh, Kieran. I want everyone to get behind the NDIS.
basically. That's my big thing. It's like I want to see disabled people rise and participate in more panels like this and actually be given the spotlight and a chance to show some leadership. Perfect, yeah. uh, perfect yeah. comment to leave the program. Thank you very much. Thank you. Well, that's all we have time for tonight. Please thank our panel, Christian Porter, Kieran Stammel, David Lionhelm, Anthony Albanese and Judith Brett. Now, remember, you can continue the discussion on Q&A Extra with Tracy Holmes and BuzzFeed's Australian political editor, Mark DiStefano. They're taking talk back and comments on ABC News Radio and Facebook Live as soon as we finish. Now, Donald Trump may be out of Paris, but Australia is still in, as you've just heard tonight. And on Friday, the chief scientist will report on how Australia should move towards secure, low-carbon electricity to meet its Paris targets. Well, next week, Q&A will bring together the key players when Environment Minister and Energy Minister Josh Frydenberg and Shadow Ener Energy Minister Mark Butler join Chief Scientist Alan Finkel and key stakeholders to discuss this enormous political and policy challenge. Until then, good night. <laughs>